in. I'm Pastor Andrew F. Carter. Uh, we had a little technical difficulties, but we are good to go. Now we, we know what's going on. So as you guys are coming in, please let me know where you are and what time it is. I'm going to give people a little bit of time to get back in. Uh, started at 10, but there was a new update on YouTube and it wasn't allowing me to go horizontal. It was making me go uh, vertical. And so um, took the brain trust myself and Kyra to get that figured out. So check it out. Come on in. We are good to go. Today, as we come in, I want to let you guys know why I feel like leaving Christianity. Right Today might be a little heavy, you might resonate, this might not even speak to you, but I want to talk to you guys why I feel like leaving Christianity. And I'm not, so just as a disclaimer, I'm not going anywhere. I love Jesus, I love the people of God. I believe that God saved me for a plan and a purpose. However, many days it feels heavy, many days I feel burdened, and you guys might be able to relate. If you look at social media, you look at the news, we're bombarded with images of hatred and war and division and discouragement, and sometimes it is overwhelming. So first and foremost, I want to say a quick prayer, and then we will jump into today's sermon and message. So Heavenly Father, I just want to give you the praise, the glory, and the honor. God, you are good. You are faithful. You are trustworthy. You are just. You are merciful. God, you are love. I pray, Lord, right now in the mighty name of Jesus and by the power of his blood that you would give us eyes to see, ears to hear, and Lord, that you would soften our hearts. God, I pray even right now that you would encourage my brothers and sisters to listen twice as much as they speak. I pray that right now you would open their hearts and help them to be receptive. God, how is it that you want us to live? What is it that you want us to do? How do you want us to treat one another? God, I pray that you would receive all praise, all glory, and all honor. I pray that there would be none of me and that it would be all of you. God, we pray this in the mighty name of Jesus Christ. Amen and amen. So again, I, I feel, again, feelings. My faith is much stronger than my feelings, but I feel some days like being a Christian is hard and not in the, the sense of hard because of the name of Jesus, not hard in the sense that the world is weighing down on me, hard that it's difficult to sit silent and watch Christians behave badly, to, to, to behave unbiblically, to treat people in ways that are pushing them further and further from the place that they need to be. If you look at social media right now, you have Christians battling between who do they stand with? Are you pro-Israel or are you pro-Palestine? You have people who are condemning others. Are you celebrating Halloween or are you for trick or trunk or trick or treating or a harvest festival? You even see people because of the, the new election that's coming up. Are you Republican or are you Democrat? And before you fill my comment section with where you are as a Christian, what you should be, this message is probably for you. So I would encourage you to hold your tongue, hold your comment, and let me unpack what it is that I'm trying to share with you guys. In today's day and age, some of the most hateful people that I've witnessed are Christians. Let that sink in for just a moment. And again, you might live in an echo chamber where everybody's loving and kind and caring, but for just a second, I want you to vision with me. A lot of the ministry that we do is online. It's on social media. It's uh, on Instagram and YouTube and TikTok and LinkedIn and uh, threads and all, all of these different platforms. And over the last couple of weeks, it's become exhausting. I I've logged in looking for a brief moment of reprieve just to check in and maybe celebrate some wins of my friends and check in with some of the pages that I enjoy following. And all that I see is rhetoric. All I see is division. I see hatred being spewed. I see in the comment sections, Christians saying bold statements like, if you believe this, then you're not a Christian. If you stand for this, then you're not a Christian. If you vote this way, you're not a Christian. There are Christians disqualifying, judging, and basically discarding other believers based on a decision that people are making through the internet. 
it is disheartening. It's heavy. It's challenging. It is something that uh, many times leaves me exhausted, overwhelmed, and even discouraged. It reminds me that it's no wonder why there is this mass exodus uh, of people from organized religion. We talk about filling our churches and reaching the lost and saving souls and preaching the gospel and going out on mission, but we're doing a poor job in our own backyard of loving one another here on friendly soil. Many times when you look at Christianity, what you see and what is highly represented is division is judgment and hatred. There's even a saying, a slogan used by the lost that says there is no hate that's greater than Christian love. Let that sink in for just a moment. There is no hate like Christian love. We hide behind the terms of love because it is a shield that we can use. Well, brother, I'm calling it out because I love them. Well, brother, I'm standing in love. This is what God wants me to do. God wants me to take my opinion, my stance, or my belief to a comment section or to social media and to spew it out onto people, no matter where they are in their walk, no matter where they are in their process of sanctification, no matter how new or young of a new believer that they are, they create these hurdles and these obstacles and they make these black and white statements, not taking into account the experience of other people, not knowing where they are in their walk or what chapter of their sanctification that they've walked in on. And so many times when people are making these bold statements, like if you say this or if you believe this or if you do this or if you stand for this, then you're not a Christian. It creates more confusion than conviction. You're not helping anybody in their walk. Action speaks louder than words. We proclaim that I'm doing it in love. But all that you're doing is exalting yourself, creating a platform where you now look highly educated or as if you've reached this level of spirituality that isn't attained by the rest. And anybody who doesn't believe what you believe or think the way that you think is a heathen and doesn't know Jesus. And that couldn't be further from the truth. You don't know them. I believe that we are called to love our brothers and sisters in truth and in spirit. However, I believe and stand on the fact that you must have a relationship with somebody before rebuking them. I would encourage you to walk a mile in their shoes. I would encourage you to sit down and have a conversation, get to know who they are. If you don't know somebody, I don't believe that you have the authority to speak into their life. Correct me if I'm wrong or if you believe otherwise but I haven't seen it really successful. I haven't seen anybody who has no relationship step into somebody's life and rebuke them for the way that they're living in love, right? Masked again, in, I'm doing it in love. But there is no rebuke if there is no relationship. It's like a, it's like a, a, a clanging cymbal. It's like, you know, those wind up monkeys with the drums and they bah, 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 bah. It's like you're putting your cymbals on each side of their head and you're in love trying to rebuke them, but they don't even know you and you're slamming these cymbals against their ear. You're like the Energizer Bunny and their head is the drum and you just keep going and going and going and going and I'm beating them to, I'm beating them with truth and with love and I'm trying to encourage you, brother, and they're like, I don't even know you. Who are you? You've never had a conversation with me. You haven't don't, like dived deep into my childhood trauma or why I'm like this or why I believe this. I believe that the sin that we're so passionate against many times has a root. It has, uh, there, there's something that might have occurred in somebody's life. And if you could get to know them and dive into their, like who they are, I believe that God gives you insight and the Holy Spirit is allowed to speak into those moments. We have to be tactful. We have to be careful. We have to be gentle. The scripture that I want to discuss with you guys, and I've got quite a few, but it's found in John chapter 13, verses 34 and 35. I'm going to read out of the New King James Version. You guys, this is my Bible. I'm going to stand behind it. I'm going to stand on it. And I'm going to stand for it. In verse 34, Peter tells the disciples, A new commandment I give to you, that you love one another 
Put that in the comment section just for, for one second. Love one another. This is Jesus speaking to the disciples. Those who have put faith in Jesus, our brothers and sisters. He says that you would love one another as I have loved you, that you also love one another. We have to think, how did Jesus love us? He loved us unconditionally. He loved us without boundary. He loved us without bias. He loved us without opinion. He was perfect, righteous, sinless, and blameless. And he came down and met us where we were in our dysfunction, in our hurt, in our pain, in our sin, in our muck and our mire. Our opinions and thoughts and beliefs could have been in left field, but he met us where we were. And he loved us enough to be patient with us. Love, verse 35 says, By this all will know that you are my disciples, if you have love for one another. People aren't going to know that you are a follower of Jesus by how you vote, by your stance, by your opinion, who you stand with, what you celebrate, the holidays you do and don't celebrate, the food you do and don't abstain from. That's not how people are going to recognize you as a follower of Jesus. Because there are very evil, wicked people who believe some of the same things and do the same things that you do. That's not the defining factor of a disciple or a follower of Jesus. A defining factor of a follower of Jesus is by how you love one another. How do you love your brothers and sisters? How do you love other followers? How do you love believers and those who are in the body of Christ? I think that we need to do a quick recap on what love truly is. And again, do not mince my words or mistake me for what I'm saying. I have a strong stance against sin. And I have a strong stance on things that are against the Bible when it comes to marriage, when it comes to life, when it comes to politics with who I stand for. But what I don't do is get on this platform and spew out what it is and where I stand because it's not my stance or opinion or the things that I believe that changes people. It's the Holy Spirit and the love of Jesus. Hear me loud and clear. I do not have a soft stance against any of those issues. However, I do understand that messages like those are saved for the body of Christ when we're together, when it's time to edify. But my seeker service on Sunday is filled with unbelievers and it's called for a time of evangelism. So I don't need to get up there and call people out by their sin and let them know where it is that I stand and all of the opinions and the things that make me so upset. And you're not a Christian if you do this or that because all that does is create confusion and distraction and division. How are we going to save the lost when we isolate them and we continuously push them away? How do you love one another? Love, as defined in 1 Corinthians chapter 13, Verses 4 through 11 says this, and I want you to be honest. I want you to give yourself an honest inventory about your love, right? How did Jesus love us? This is what love is. Love is patient. Is your love for your brothers and sisters in Christ patient? Do you understand that not everybody is at the same spiritual maturity level as you are? Did you forget where God found you and how he found you? Did you forget the journey that you've been on? Are you quick to dismiss people when they make a mistake or when they fail? Are you quick to hold on to the wrongs done to you rather than extending grace and patience, understanding that all things are working for his good and for his glory? Love is kind. Are the words that are coming out of your mouth and the way that you treat other brothers and sisters, is it kind? Or are you quick to make assumptions? Are you quick to put a period where God put a comma? Are you quick to uh, discard people? It does not envy, it does not boast, it is not proud. All I see are proud, envious, and boastful Christians telling other Christians who and who they are not based on their specific stance or preference, not even, not even biblical things. They're upset and they're pressed because people don't agree with where they stand, not realizing that many times where people are is between them and God. And what we're doing isn't loving, where we're many times pushing them further away. Verse five, love does not dishonor others. <sighs> That's a whole sermon in and of itself. I see so much dishonoring, people dishonoring one another. 
It's not self-seeking. It's not easily angered. It keeps no records of wrongs. It's not easily angered, but we're so quick to get mad when somebody doesn't agree with us rather than seeking understanding, rather than coming off the internet and picking up the phone and having a conversation, going out to coffee and discussing some of the differences, we get angry. We start to attack. It says that it doesn't keep records of wrongs. I can tell you right now, I'm pretty sure many of you have a record of wrongs. Well, so-and-so cut me off in the parking lot. Well, they didn't say hi to me. They didn't compliment me on my new hairdo. Well, so-and-so didn't do this. Well, there's still shoes just laying down in the hall. Well, the dishes, I'm not getting any help around this house. Well, this, 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 this. You're keeping track of all of the wrongs, all the hurts, all of the mistakes, all of the offenses that have been done to you. Is that really love? We say with our mouth, oh, I love you, I love you, I love you, but your actions speak louder than your words. Love does not delight in evil, but rejoices with truth. If this is offending you, I would encourage you to take a step back, and we're going to do this together. Do some reflection. Are you a part of the problem? Are you one of the people that spews hatred, anger, division, and confusion because you see other Christians not living as holy as you are? Love protects. It trusts. It always hopes. I hope that just because somebody isn't where I'm at, that one day they will be. I hope that one day they won't just be where I'm at, but they will surpass my knowledge and understanding of who Jesus is. I hope that that person who's backslidden will come back. I hope that the individual who is lost in their marriage will find reconciliation. I pray that the person, uh, I hope that the person who's lost in the bottle of booze or in a bottle of pain medication, I hope that the person who is sold out right now uh, to pornography and sexual immorality and lust, I hope that they don't stay there, but that the Holy Spirit would penetrate their lives, pull them out of the muck and mire, and bring them to a place of repentance and relationship with God through the blood of Jesus Christ. I hope that the people who don't believe the same thing that I believe or have the same stance or celebrate some of the things that I don't choose to celebrate, I hope that through the conviction of the Holy Spirit that they will inch their way through the process of sanctification, that the truth would be revealed to them and that their hearts would be changed. That does not come from me beating them down, shaming them, claiming that they're not saved, claiming that they don't know Jesus, claiming that the truth's not in them. It's me hoping and believing and understanding, being patient, not being proud and realizing that people are at different places in their journey with Jesus than we are and creating a space where people can grow without the fear of judgment, without the opinions of other Christians, without feeling discarded or or let go or pushed away because they're not where everybody else is. Jesus didn't do that to you and we shouldn't do that to other believers. It always perseveres. Love never fails. But I feel like in the body, there's a lot of failing. There's not a lot of love. There's a lot of judgment. There's a lot of clicks. There's a lot of selfishness. There's a lot of division. And it breaks my heart. It's heavy. I woke up this morning asking myself, Lord, is this what you really want me to share? 3.30, he said yes. I said, well, let me sleep on it. Maybe that's just me. 4.30, is this what you want me? Yeah, that's it. Went back to sleep. 6.30, I got two more hours. Are you sure? He said, this is what it is. This is an on-time word for the body of Christ. Where there are prophecies, they will cease. Where there are tongues, they will be stilled. Where there is knowledge, it will pass away. Verse 9 says this, for we know in part and we prophesy in part. All of the things that you know and are convicted of and you have these stances on, We only know a part of where God is. We only know a part uh, of God's plan. We only know a part of God's purpose. We only know a part of God's will. We don't even know things in its entirety. We don't know where people are in their lives. We don't know what they've gone through. We don't know what God's doing in them, what God's doing through them. We don't know the setup that God is making out of somebody's set back. We know in part. You guys, if we could get to a place where we understand that we know so little. Beware of the person who thinks that they know it all, that has everything figured out. Thank God 
that the path to heaven doesn't pass through my neighbor's front yard because if it was up to other believers, in many cases, I wouldn't even be saved. We know in part, but when completeness comes, what is in part disappears. When Jesus comes, all truth will be revealed. All of these little partial truths. Well, I stand for this. Well, I believe this. Well, I do that. Well, I do this. Well, you're not supposed to do that. Well, you're not supposed to do these things that we know in part will truly be revealed. And I believe that many of us are dying on hills that we were never called to even stand on. The only cause and the only hill that we as believers should be standing on and dying for is the hill that proclaims that Jesus Christ is the way, the truth, and the life, and nobody goes to the Father except for through him. It is through the free gift of salvation that comes only through faith in Jesus. So many of us are caught up in the things of this world that we're missing the mission that's right before us. Don't you think the devil loves that? Don't you think the devil takes joy in that? He's excited that you are pushing your brother or sister in Christ away that you are discounting their salvation, that you are questioning the fact that they even know Christ Jesus through faith in him. That is division. And the devil, we're playing right into his hands by these, these, these impossible stances. Not everything is black and white. We see in part, we won't see the full picture of what God's doing, done, or is going to do until Jesus comes back again. Verse 11 says, when I was a child, I talked like a child. I thought like a child, I reasoned like a child. When I became a man, I put the ways of childhood behind me. What I see is a lot of childish Christians and not childlike Christians. Childish, they're still speaking like their kids. They're still acting like their kids. They're still behaving like their kids and not children of God, not imitators of Jesus because Jesus was love. Jesus wasn't there. He was less concerned about stances, opinions, and all of the things that we argue about. He was more concerned with people and loving them, meeting them where they were, having a seat, getting to know who they were, and then allowing the Spirit of God to wash over them, to cleanse them and transform them. But because of, of, of the way that we think our childish behavior we get so caught up in fighting with our brothers and sisters that we forget to encourage, edify, uplift, pray, uh, disciple, like, uh, like to help one another, to love one another. Where's the love is the question that I ask myself on a regular basis. You might wonder why I don't get caught up in posting those things or sharing those things. And what Christians would say is you're sitting on the fence, brother. You're scared to make a stance. That's not true. That's not true. God has given me revelation that there is a time for evangelism and there is a time for edification. I will make those stances in the assembly of the believers, but I don't need non-believers or unbelievers to know where I stand in any of those situations. And, and these social media platforms are just that. They're used to encourage, to, to, to lift up, to draw people in. This social media platform that God has allowed me to steward is like a net that is being thrown out and it's gathering believers and unbelievers alike. This is not the place for me to make a bold stand on the do's, the don'ts, the this and the that. What I'm trying to do is preach the good news in a world that is filled with bad news. Once you gather them, you bring those fish in, you start to get them cleaned up, and then you bring them into the flock, you bring them into the fold, and that's where you edify. That's where you preach about the stance and the do's and the don'ts. That's where you build them up. But I don't need to make a post when 300 million people are already posting about it. I get messages, well, where do you stand? Why haven't you talked on it? Why haven't you spoke about it? Because everybody else and their mother already has. What, what good is it for one more voice to join this echo chamber of division? I'm passionate about it. So my question is, where's the love? Love would be seeking to understand. Hey, you think that way? Maybe we should grab some coffee. I'd love for you to explain a little bit more on why you think that way. Hey, I don't really understand where you're coming from. 
I've never walked in your shoes. I've never experienced life through your eyes or from your perspective. Maybe we can hop on a phone call and you can share some of those things to help me get a better understanding. That's love. But that's not what we do. We see somebody make a stance or an opinion or a belief or they say that they're doing something and it's claws are out. We're gonna attack that individual. We're gonna attack their faith. We're gonna attack their relationship with God. We're gonna claim that they don't even know Jesus, that they're unbiblical, that they're a heretic and a false teacher. Seek to understand. Love would be asking questions. Love would be listening twice as much as you speak. Love would be having a conversation. And love would be praying for that individual more than gossiping about them. I'm going to say that last one one more time. Love would be praying for that individual more than gossiping about them. There is a freedom in Christ. And we're going to turn to Galatians chapter 5, verse 1. The freedom that I'm speaking about is that there is room for you to figure out who you are in Christ, where you are in Christ, what God wants to do in you and through you. There is space and freedom to learn that. And I'm so thankful that I had the freedom to explore who I was, what I stood for, where, uh, where, where I was in certain topics but it wasn't because of other people influencing me. It was through the influence of the Holy Spirit and time spent with God. But what we don't do is allow that freedom. We immediately drop the hammer down or again, put a period where God's putting a comma or we make an assumption or we draw a conclusion based on the chapter of people's lives that we walk in on. So in Galatians chapter five, verse one, it says, it is for freedom that Christ has set us free. Stand firm then and do not let yourselves be burdened again by a yoke of slavery. The Christians that I'm describing that I see, and maybe this isn't even you, right? Maybe this isn't you. Maybe you're somebody who, uh, if you don't like something, you keep scrolling. Uh, you try to add value. You try to encourage. You try to uplift. You are quick to listen and have conversations. You seek understanding. Maybe this is speaking exactly to who you are. And I pray that those of you watching are in that place. I pray that we've done a good job of discipling and really creating an environment and atmosphere where people are understanding and following that lead. But what I'm seeing in so on social media and just in the world today is that the Christians out there, I keep putting quotes on them because listen, they're more like modern day Pharisees than anything. Jesus reserved his harshest criticism for the religious leaders of his day. Think about that. It wasn't the woman at the well, it wasn't the prostitutes or the woman caught in adultery, it wasn't uh, blind Bartimaeus, it wasn't the tax collectors, it wasn't the sinners, the demoniacs or those who had leprosy, right, social outcasts. It wasn't the people who you think that there would be this righteous anger and harsh response towards. It was the religious leaders of his day. And I believe that Jesus today would be flipping over tables and would reserve from his, some of his harshest criticism for people who are found inside the Christian church today. I believe that many, many brothers and sisters have hardened their hearts, whether it's through hurt, whether it's loss or pain. And again, I'm in a place where I'm patient with them. I understand that we allow religiosity and the hardness of the heart to take place because maybe we've been done wrong or maybe we were hurt or maybe we were spiritually manipulated or emotionally manipulated. Maybe there's some church hurt there. And so we put up our walls and we start to shun people from our holy high horses. So even there, there's love. Talk to me, brother. Talk to me, sister. Why is your heart so hardened? Why are you so quick to write people off? Why are you so quick to discount people's relationship with Jesus? But I believe that that's what we would see. I believe that Jesus would reserve some of his harshest criticism for the people inside the Christian church today. We opened with John chapter 13, verse 34. He says, a new commandment I give to you that you love one another as I have loved you, 
that you also love one another. Love one another as I have loved you. One thing and characteristic that I'm so grateful for is that God was patient. God was patient. In 2 Peter chapter 3, verse 9, it says, The Lord is not slow in keeping his promise, as some understand slowness. Instead, he is patient with you, not wanting anyone to perish, but everyone to come to repentance. The person you don't agree with, the person who doesn't stand like you or vote like you or celebrate like you or believe like you, the people who might be close to you but appear far from God, God has a plan for, God has a purpose, God loves, God is working in their life. You might look at somebody and go, man, you've been saved three years and you're just not there. You're still dabbling with this. You're still wrestling with this. Are you even saved? We go, God, what's happening with them? What, why are they not maturing at the same level? I remember when I was three years in, I was passing out tracks, knocking on doors and baptizing people. What's wrong with this individual? We're not extending the same patience, grace, or love that God has extended to us. He is not slow in keeping his promise. He is patient with you. He's patient with me. He doesn't want anyone to perish, but everyone to come to a place of repentance. Please stop projecting your own spiritual maturity and rate of growth onto the people around you. God does different things in different people, in different places, in different ways. Stop trying to put God in a box and the way that you received the Holy Spirit and God transformed your life isn't going to be uh, an exact image or mold in the same way that he does it for every other person. I was at an amazing conference this weekend in Atlanta and the context of the conference is called My Boulevard. It's for church planters who are planting in inner city and urban areas that are oftentimes affected by gentrification. It's a lot of big words, but if you don't know what I'm trying to say, it's for church planters in the hood, in the Inglewoods, in the Atlantas, in the St. Louis, in the Los Angeles area, in the New Yorks, like in the areas where not a lot of people want to plant churches because the, the, the level of lostness is extreme. There's a lot of distrust for the church. There's not a lot of giving because people don't got a lot to give. There's uh, the, the context of church planting on my boulevard is an extremely challenging task. But I go there trying to be equipped and uh, to, to be built up and to be spoken into and to be taught and to learn new leadership skills and tactics and strategies and uh, how to see what it is that God wants us to do in this place. But I share that with you because what I had a chance to see are men and women more like me? Misfits, people who might have had a run in with the law, people who didn't grow up in church, many people who have been discarded or written off, or people who aren't necessarily looked at as impactful leaders. But when you hear about what they're doing and what God's doing in their city and in these lost places, you can't help but give God praise, glory, and honor because he's using broken people like myself and like many of you to impact this world in some of the roughest neighborhoods around the world. It's a beautiful thing. And so it reminds me, and I was reminded of the different stories, people who have been shot, people who grew up in gangs, people who have gone to prison, people who have, were, were like giving themselves to the streets, like the, the, the vast majority of the leaders and people and preachers and pastors were people who had passed. And thank God that he didn't give up on them. Thank God that he was patient with them. Thank God that he didn't discard them based on where they were, but he built them up and brought them to a place where he can now work in them and through them. How beautiful would the body of Christ be if we had the same patience with people who we bring up and put under our wing? The same brothers and sisters in the church body. Again, a part of our body, if we would be more patient and edifying and encouraging and lifting them up instead of shaming them and condemning them and hitting them with guilt and judging them and wagging our finger at them. I see far too much of it. So that brings me to a call of action, right? great sermon, Pastor. Pissed a lot of people off uh, because I'm not out there condemning the lost or I'm 
allowing people the time and space and grace to grow into who it is that God's called them to be. Uh, I believe that that's the right thing to do. But applicably, what I think that we must do is one of two things. The first one is to repent. Whether you like it or not, I personally am going to preach to myself. I have been guilty of discounting people, writing people off, being short with people. I've even said it on live. And, and, and God forgive me for saying this. In my exhaustion and being burnt out, I've said, oh, I love people, but I don't like people. And I'm ashamed that I've said that. And even as I'm preaching, I can see moments where people were a lot. People were heavy. People were ASK, ask holes. They were asking questions and I was pouring into their life. And then they were walking away and not doing anything that it was that I shared with them. And I would allow that to affect the amount of love that I would extend to those individuals. Forgetting where I came from, forgetting that many times I myself was an ASK asshole in many situations where I've asked and asked and asked and then even being poured into went a completely different direction. So, so I'm even ashamed to say that I need to repent for the hardness of my heart, for the religiosity that I've, I've allowed to creep in, for the division, for the hatred, for being judgmental, for not extending the same love, patience, and grace that God has extended to me. And so I publicly repent and say, if that was, if you were ever somebody who I was short with in that manner, I ask that you would forgive me. I've asked God that he would forgive me as well. And I wanna close with a prayer found in Psalm chapter 139, verses 23 and 24. I believe that this should be our call, each and every one of us, as we go away from this time spent together, that you would be just meditating on this scripture, that this would be your prayer or your heart's cry. It says, search me, God, and know my heart. Test me and know my anxious thoughts. See if there is, is an offensive way in me and lead me in the way everlasting. Our cry is, God, search me. In what areas am I being divisive? In what areas am I making a stand that is more harmful and pushing people away than it is bringing people in? Am I actually fulfilling the Great Commission by preaching the good news of Jesus? Or have I allowed my heart to become so hardened because I've been hurt, right? Hurt people hurt people. Have I allowed my heart to become so hardened and filled with hurt that I'm pushing the very people who need Jesus away? Test me and know my anxious thoughts. God, see if there is an offensive way in me. And I can probably tell you that there will be an offensive way. Uh, unfortunately, we are far from perfect and uh, many of us fail on a daily basis, myself included. And so this is a dangerous prayer to pray. And I would encourage you to soften your heart and open your eyes, tune your ears out from this world and into the voice of God. Because when you pray this prayer, this dangerous prayer to search me and to show me the ways, be ready for him to let you know all of the areas where you may or may not be falling short. Let's pray and have a great rest of our day. So Heavenly Father, I just want to thank you for the time that we got to spend together. Lord, even in the midst of technical difficulties, I'm thankful for every man, woman, and child that made it a point to get to this place today. Lord, I am thankful for the body of Christ that you are building up and developing. But Lord, I believe that we are falling short in many areas. God, I don't think that we're doing a great job of loving like you've loved us. God, in many instances, people know more about what we're against than what we're for. And so we're asking that you would change that, that you would help us to be the lights of this dark world, that you would help us to create spaces that are sanctuaries for those who are lost, people who are searching and seeking for truth. God, help us to be hubs and centers for those who are looking for you, God, a, a safe place for them to run to. Lord, again, search our hearts. Show us the areas in our lives where we are missing the mark, falling short, where we're, we're allowing sin to reign, where we're allowing our flesh to take root. And God, teach us to truly love, being patient and kind and gentle. 
being uh, without boasting or rejoicing in evil. God, help us to be more like Jesus. To you, Lord, belong the praise, glory, and honor. There is no God like you. And we give you, God, we give you the honor. Thank you for pulling us out of the pit. Thank you for picking us up from our rock bottoms. Thank you, God, for saving our souls and helping us to find a home in you. I just pray over my brothers and sisters this morning that as they leave this place, this word would plant seeds. We know that your word does not return void. So I pray that it would plant seeds that develop roots that are deep down into their lives that will one day eventually bear fruit. So thank you, Lord, for having your way with us. And I just pray all of this by the power of the blood and in the mighty name of Jesus Christ. Amen and amen. Thank you guys for joining. I hope uh, that this message was encouraging and I look forward to seeing you guys back here tomorrow morning. Have a great rest of your day.